throne of God. Amen. We are going to lift him up tonight. And we're going to ask God to empower him, God to give him the strength, the wisdom, <clears throat> as he has the privilege to take on the floor tonight to teach us, to lead us, the book of Romans. So tonight, we are going to ask God that, Lord, it is not his power, the Lord is your power. It is not his strength, the Lord is your strength. It is the wisdom that comes from you. Give him that wisdom that comes from you. Empower him tonight. Use him tonight. Use him tonight. We are going to lift Dr. Osman tonight as he's about to take on the Bible setting tonight. Let us pray for him. Lift him. Church, we, we thank God to come together tonight again to study the Word of God, and we want to thank our General Vasya for starting us off on Chapter Three, in which he went a, a, a great length to explain to us the advantages of being a Jew, and, and also the disadvantage when it comes to the law before God and righteousness before God and men. So uh, uh, the Kabo is going to continue from verses nine. So, so that um, we will be greatly blessed tonight I if we can also try as much as possible to listen to him and then contribute uh, positively by asking questions and, um, and then making comments. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome uh, Dr. Osman Kagbo uh, to, to the forum. Dr. Dr. Osman, welcome, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Saints of Mount Zion. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Bless you, bless you. All right, let me, uh, I'm sorry, just, uh, right for me, grab my text here. So today, we're going to study the book of Romans, 
and um, we will be studying the text from Romans 3 all the way I'm starting from verse 9 and we'll see how far we can go well, we start on Romans just 3 verse 9 and I'm going to read the text before we delve into the study so that we all have a context uh, context of what we are studying today okay so Romans chapter 3 reading from verse 9 what shall we conclude then do we have any advantage not at all for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin as it is written there is no one righteous not even one there is no one who understands there is no one who seeks God all are turned away they have together become worthless there is no one who does good not even one said Pastor Tim their throats are open graves their tongues practice deceit the poison of vipers is on their lips Verse 14. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Verse 16. Ruin and misery mark their ways. Verse 17. And the way of peace they do not know. Verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And verse 19, if we get there, now we know that whatever the law says, it, saw, it, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth is in silence and the whole world held accountable to God. Verse 20, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the words of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. Through the law, we become conscious of our sins. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So tonight, I think we are talking about righteousness. Of course, it's a contrast, righteousness and sin. Mm -hmm. Paul is trying to highlight the point here that we are all sinners. But he, he started off trying to explain or kind of give the scenario that most people view themselves as good sinners, right? Mm -hmm. Every one of us here, you know, we are good sinners. We are sinners, but we are good. We are the good sinners. Mm. I know I'm not perfect, people will say. I know I'm not perfect. I've got my share of fault. No, but I'm, I'm not a murderer. No, no. I'm not a terrorist. I don't blow people up or a child molester or you know I don't do drugs I don't do things that are um, lack of a better word perceived um, hurtful or harmful to others I don't engage in all of this stuff I'm a decent person so you know we go on and say well you know I'm a sinner but I'm a good sinner. Are you a good 
sin. So Paul is trying to explore this idea that, you know, you have good sinners, you have bad sinners. Good sinners are especially, as we, we all know, are especially religious ones, religious people. And it often turns out to be that we are the most difficult to reach with the gospel. <clears throat> you know, you start talking to someone, oh, I'm a Christian too, so what, what, are you gonna, what, are, what are you going to tell me? I go to church, I pay my tithe, I do this, so they will give you a laundry list of things that they do that makes them a good sinner. These are the individuals that are added and added to the church government. They serve in the church. In fact, some of them are even leaders in the church. And they prepare these positions for many, many years. So it becomes more natural to them as if it, it, it's what they're calling. They, you know, they just have to be the head of um, this ministry, the head of that, you know, because they are cool sinners. They're sinners, but you know, they're not like the other guy, the other bad guys out there. And if you try to point out some of the things that may not be right, they will come down hard on you. Uh, who, who, who are you? Who do you think you are? I've been in this church for 40 years. So what are you trying to tell me? <clears throat> and sometimes they can even catch up the pastor, you know, because if they've been, been there for long enough, maybe that pastor was hired and brought to that ministry, you know, to lead that ministry, they will tell you that I've been here longer than you are. So what are you going to tell me? I've been a Christian before you were born. I am a good Christian. I'm a, a good sinner. But Paul was trying to create a picture for these people whom I might venture to say Jews, who he's trying to reach to understand that we are all sinners. Talking to religious people and to the Jews can be difficult. That's true. But Paul understood that if the Jews trusted in their religiosity and the good works that they do, they will not see the need to trust in Christ. They will not see the need to lean on him, to look up to him and save him. So he has to bring it out so that they will understand that they are sinners. But he has to put it in context in a way that can really deliver the message. If they don't understand that they are sinners, they will not see the need to be rescued from the, the uh, impending judgment. Because if, uh, as I laid out, uh, uh, as I started uh, sharing this evening, those people, individuals who have been in the church for many years, who have held positions, who have you know done this good Christians, pay their tithes and do all these things. They have that sense of accomplishment as far as their relationship with God because of the things that they have done. So even though they trust they profess, they say that they trust in Christ. Even though they profess that, you know, they trust in him, they will only do it minimally. They will be their love for him. They will only do things 
these are not the type of people that will go the extra mile to be saved or to, I mean to not to be saved because they are now saved that Christian they've accepted Christ and have their salvation. But these are the people that will not go the extra mile to receive the crown. Because they believe that they've done enough. They've arrived. They go to church. They are the good sinners. So there's no need for them to do anything extra. So this is what Paul is trying to make known to um, the, 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 the congregation. So Paul is trying to explain this. To show them why everyone needs the gospel. Because according to him, everyone is under God's just condemnation. So Paul decided to go into, um, into the, I mean, the Old Testament, even as he was um, explaining to them about the situation, so that they, they can understand that Jews and Gentiles are all on the same. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. But the Jews thought that, oh, they are, they are good. I mean, it's, a, it's about the Gentiles. But he wants to remind them that, no, we are all. Here in, um, in, in um, I believe in Romans chapter 1, you know, where he leveled some charges, telling them that both Jews and Greeks are all on the, on the scene. So he went back into the Old Testament in Psalm 53. Let's see if I can do that. Psalm 53. Verse, I'll just read verse 3. He said, everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. All have become corrupt. <clears throat> there is no one who does good. Not even one. Not even one. So, if we come back and contrast that to what he said in verse 13, in the chapter that I read earlier, in Romans 3, in verse 14, Paul said, he said, their thoughts are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit, they are lying, they are liars. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Poison of they are dangerous. The poison of vipers are on their lips. We all know viper, dangerous snake. Sure. So with their tongue, they can kill. With their tongue, they can cause destruction. They can cause a lot of damage. The poison of vipers is on their tongues or their lips. They lie at Jehovah as we say in our dialect. So Paul was trying to emphasize this, going quoting scriptures in the Old Testament, you know, to make his point. In Psalm 5, verse 9, Psalm 5, verse 9, the Bible says, Psalm 5. Psalm 5 verse 9. Okay. It says, For there is no faithful in their faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction, their throat is open to they flatter with their tongue. Hmm. So basically, that's the Psalm 5 verse 9. And what Paul is saying in Romans 3 13 is basically the same, more or less paraphrasing what um, David said in the book of Psalms. He went on to say in Psalm 140, verse 3, he said, They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent. They make their tongues as sharp.
that has a serpent, the poison of vipers is on their lips. So it's basically the same thing that was said in the book of Psalms, not exactly what Paul is either saying, or this might be an interpretation from Greek to Hebrew, or vice versa. Mm. But it's just making the point that these people, these individuals, who think they are good citizens, these are some of the things that they carry. These are some of the behavior, the character that they exhibit. Mm. But we are the good Christians. We are the good sinners. So verse 14 comes also from Psalm, Psalm 10, verse 7. Verse 14 says, Verse 14 says, He said, Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That's what verse, Romans 3, verse 14 says. Right? And Psalm 10, verse 7 says, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. <laughs> so, of course, we all have committed sins. Sins sometimes that destroy relationships. Yeah. But as Christians, we ought to be conscious of the effects of our words. How we relate to others. How we um, describe others. The, the things that we say about others. With our tongue, with our lips. May God help us all. Amen. We are the good sinners. Amen. We are the good sinners. So Paul went on and on and on in verse in Isaiah fifty nine, verse seven and eight. He talks about the root cause of our sinful behavior. He said, Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. Acts of violence mark their ways. So it becomes normal for them. The way of peace, they do not know. You wake up in the morning, they are ready to fight. They are ready for for for, for quiet. They are ready for things that are destructive to others. The way of peace they do not know. They don't know what is peace. They just want um, um, quarrel or they want um, um, you know to do things that are harmful or hurtful to others. There is no justice in their path. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. Mm. So if you are around them, forget about peace. If you are friends, forget about peace. It's always turmoil. It's always trouble. So this is what Paul is laying out for us. In verse 17, and Romans 3, 17, he said, And the way of peace they do not know. Just what I just read in Isaiah, more or less just repeated there. They do not know peace. There is, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They are good sinners. But there is no fear of God. 
because they now see God as you know this abstract being. Because for them, what is what matters is the physical things that they do. They go to church. They do what the law says, you know, okay, then give your tithe. They're doing these things. So as long as those things, you can check those boxes, everything is good. They are good sinners. So Paul has laid out these illustrations just to ensure that um, these people, his, his people, the Jews here, understand that they, they are, or see their inadequacies. Because we all know the Bible tells us that the Jews are, were favored. God loved them. God gave them things that revelations that should put them in a position of advantage. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are any different. They are sinners, just like everyone else. So, but even though they have all this revelation, they have all these advantages, <coughs> as we studied in, the, um, in one of our in our, uh, in Romans earlier. They did not use these things necessarily to their advantage. Instead, they dwell in sin even further. See, and, and sometimes we also tend to think that, you know, our faults are not so bad. I mean, they're not as bad, they're not as bad as. Uh, what we are describing here, what Paul is describing here. I may have, you know, bent the truth a little bit at times. I say things here about people, I do this. But that's really, you know, not what I do. Yeah, once in a while. But these things can actually destroy the lives of others, the people around you. your co-workers, your friends, your church members. You don't have to murder someone to be a bad sinner. Your lips can be as dangerous as the gun. can be as dangerous as a knife that you can use to stab someone. So this evening, as we study the Word, I just want us to reflect on these things. I, I like for I like to bring the Bible alive, so we can examine our own personal lives in the way we interact, in the way we do things. Because all Paul is doing here is not really preaching; he's talking to the, the, the people talking to them trying to bring the best out of them trying to elucidate to things that they may not quite understand God is not saying that all these things that he has listed are things that all, every sinner does all the time but he's saying that the seeds for, for all of these sins are planted deep in every human heart. So in each and every one of our hearts, the seed of these sins have been planted. But through his common grace, the grace of God, who have prevent the sins to blossom in our hearts. This is what prevents you now from going out there and saying the things that are venom 
to the life of someone else. Imagine if you were not a Christian. You have not received salvation. You have not received the gifts of the Holy Spirit who now guides you, who now helps you. Imagine what happens. You don't understand the guardrails of life, especially spiritual guardrails, because you don't understand. But even when you understand and you decide not to do the right thing, it does not absolve you from the consequences of your action. So Paul wants us to reflect. He wants us to reflect and be not just the good sinner, but be better than that. So by nature, we know now that our hearts, our hearts, we know our hearts on the sea. If you have been raised in less favorable circumstances and are not met Christ, imagine what your situation will look like. If you don't understand how bad the disease is, you won't see the pill. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people have COVID and uh, when this came out and uh, they said, that, well, not before even they have COVID, because they don't understand how bad it is. Hey, there's a vaccine available. There, yeah, no, I'm not going to take that. But you have two options here. One that can kill you within in days if you get it, and you have another option. Potentially, it can protect your life. Now, you may be sick for a few days, a day or two, you know, but it won't kill you. But yet still, people are willing to take the chances with the op option that will really finish them. So, let me pose a question here. So we can get into some discussion. Okay. So, why are good sinners the most difficult to reach? with the gospel. Why? Mm -hmm. Dr. Osmond, can you re rephrase that again, please? Now, the question is, why are good sinners, good sinners, people who think that, you know, they are not sinners, they, they are doing good, mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. are they the most difficult to reach with the gospel? I believe the answer is in the question because they believe they are good and they are way up there and they got it all and they know it all and there's nothing you can teach them. Yeah. And so they are not willing to learn. Anybody who is not willing to learn thinks they have arrived and so they are not willing to listen because they know it all. That's my perception. Right. I, I have another yeah. I think because they're not mature Christians. I think because they're still drinking wine. Because when you become a mature Christian, it's a totally different thing. You can be a Christian from being a mature Christian. And that's all we should try. We all should try to be to be a mature Christian. <laughs> because that's what um, it, um there's a saying that Paul says in Galatians four. Um, that's wrong about being a mature Christian. I need to find that. We get them from you, Galatians 4. Galatians 4, that's one. 
now I say that the ear, that the ear, as long as it is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all. You can be a Christian if you're not a mature Christian, you're not different from an unbeliever. You're still a mature Christian and you're still um, drinking um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, milk. Okay. So we should be advancing. As I believe that, you know, you have to be a mature Christian. Another, thank you, sister. Thank you, sir. Another um, picture, picture example. It's the story of the the Pharisee that uh, went to the synagogue to go and pay tithes, and the and the and the and the publican. The Pharisee went before God, beating his chest that I did this, I did that. I'm not like this a publican, sinner, and uh, he justify himself before God. And, and, and the other publican went there with sober mind, contrary heart, he said, I, I admit I am a sinner, please uh, Father, forgive me. So, so what we are saying is, is, is that um, the, the justified sinner is so arrogant, so proud of himself that he lacks humility. And, and, and once you lack humility, you become pompous, conceit, and, and, and you feel that, uh, like uh, the Madonna said, there's nothing else anybody can teach you because you know the law, you know everything, but, but it first still remains that nobody can be saved under the law except by grace. And except that you embrace the, the doctrine of grace, you cannot be saved and you cannot even stand before God justified. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on what um, the three comments that have been made, you know, because um, when we go back to past nine things, what past nine is really, you know, saying is that we're all under an evil spiritual force, okay, which is called sin. Yeah. Okay, so we're all under that spiritual force. And of course, God does not give favorites. And it does not give salvation advantage to anyone. But when we looked at the um articles from past um eleven to eighteen where you went step by step for us and supporting each point there in um, the Old Testament scriptures with Paul cited. And if when you look at those eleven points, they are like you know, it's like somebody with a machine gun spraying all over the place. It's, it's just that's what Paul was doing there. Because rapidly, if you read that, there's, there's no righteousness, there's no one who understands it. You know, you've turned away, there's one who does not, no one does good. So it, it, she was rapidly just, in, you know, lifting down our sins. And if you look at those, those, those um, from back 10 to 11, from back 10, 11 to 16, carefully, you know, Paul was actually mentioning the serious body parts, because you talk about the mouth, you know, which is full of cursing. You know, we talk about the lips, you know, that the, vibe, the poison of the viper is on the lips. And he says the throat are open graves, you know, our feet, you know. So again, Paul mentioned every, you know, body part of our body, you know, our minds, our mouth, our throat, our tongues, our lips, our feet, and our eyes. Again, this is just emphasizing the fact, in the picture that he was painting, that people are thoroughly evil, all right? Yeah. And going back to your question, until we accept that, you know, and repent and accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of it's going to be a challenge. So the people who think that they are self-righteous or the, 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 even in Christians, as Patricia was saying, and then the Madonna was saying, Pastor Lambo, who are not mature, they will continue to struggle, you know. And so that's why, again, I go back to always saying the importance of studying the Word of God because that's how we know the mind of God and that's how we mature, you know, as Christians. And thank you.
chapter 3. Because we read it in the midst, because we don't want to bring in shame to the religion. We say we are Christian, but we lie. We say we are Christian, but we backbite. We should try to do better every day, like we try to do better in our own, in our workplaces, at our own um, personal lives, you know. So that's the reason why, another reason why. If we try for that, if we love God, if we say we love Jesus, we try to be better. Amen. 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 Yes, so it well explained here. Well explained because um, you already say no that uh, you know we, we see some professionals in some profession that um, think that they know it all so they don't even want to listen to any other opinion and if you already have that um, made that mm-hmm. determination in your heart it, beca- it becomes difficult for you are what I think they use the word you are un- un- unteachable so you know un- uncoachable or whatever I think that's there's a, a phrase that we normally use in a, in a uh, like life agents will say, you know, if you're uncoachable, then um, it's difficult to develop that individual. You're stuck wherever you are, that's where you are. You're not going to grow because you're uncoachable. You see. So we thank God and we pray that we are not, we don't exalt ourselves because, as the Bible says, those that exalt themselves. Uh, you know, that, that will, you know, will, will not be exalted by God. That's true. So, but if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. That's true. We thank God. We thank God. Amen. I have a question. So, sure. So, I know you've talked about the Christianity that says they are good Christians, they are bad. Is there any time throughout the entire passage that Apostle Paul labeled them as unbelievers? As unbelievers? Or as they have not been saved? Even though they lie like unbelievers, even though they do bad things, is there any time did he say these people are unsaved? Okay, so let's examine that for a second. Right? So, first of all, Paul makes the assertion here that they are all sinners. And he's also trying to make the point here that there is not a difference between those that are unsaved, non believers, and because we are all sinners, we all, we all we all came from that um, same uh, breed of sin. We are all sinners. I mean, let's uh, look at uh, let me see here. Just want to go back to that. Now, the, the question you pose, talking about um, on, I mean, they are not saved. Um, let me rephrase my question. I just want um, one of the pastors or anybody to answer you or anybody. I just want to know if somebody has been seen, has accepted Christ, and is still, but you know they've accepted, they've been saved, they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they still do all these bad things, fornicate, sin, and all that stuff. Would you label them as unsaved? I'll, I'll let um, anyone can ask that. I can keep jumping now. Comments as well. So, if I can get your question, you know. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Now, I was gonna. This is my opinion that once you're saved, you're saved. You can never be unsaved. Once you're saved, you're saved. You just got to come back to the righteousness of God. You go astray, but you call back into the fold. That's my thought. Unless, unless if you're back, if you're back, if you're back if you're 
right? You cannot be saved when you back when you backslide. I think that's the only um, aspect in which um, the the um, Bible says even we should not go after people who have um, you know who backslide and uh, you know constantly. Uh, Bad mouth in the face. Yeah, well, that's different. I'm not saying bad mouth in the face. Um, that's a man I want to have. And I'm saying they've been saved. They've been saved. They've accepted Jesus Christ. They've been baptized. But they're still lying. They're still doing these little things. And here and there, these religious um, scenes that, they, that Paul labeled, they're still doing that. Would you say they're unsaved? Or they're still saved? So I think I think that's a question that we all the Christians struggle with a lot, right? That a genuine born again Christian can lose salvation. But again, can that go against his word? If somebody said he has received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, you know, then can he lose his salvation? Okay, so um, I, I want us to go back to Romans chapter 6, 23. Let's, let's look at that scripture. Because what, when we get to Romans chapter 6, we are going to really deal with that question in, in great detail because that's what is going to end Romans, all of Romans chapter 6. Because um, salvation is what is eternal life, okay, according to the Bible. It's a gift of God, okay, good Lord Jesus, through um, Jesus Christ. So when we, and that's what Romans 6 is saying, this is a, a gift is characterized by three, there are three things that characterize that gift, okay? It is given freely. Out of the kingdom of generosity, which is God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. You can either accept it or reject it. Or reject it, okay? Okay? And it demands, but well, once, we rest, once we accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you know, we, it, it, it demands a responsibility, all right? Because salvation is given by grace, it's not earned by merit. So if it's not earned by merit, you cannot lose it by merit, all right? So it's the love of God, it's the grace of God. Let's take, let's, if we go back to, to, to scriptures in the Old Testament, somebody like David, David committed murder, all right? You know, lost. You know, he did everything under the sun. But God says, you're still after my heart. You know, a man after my own heart. Why? Because he always repented, all right? He repented. He never forsook his love, God, he repented. But if he commits some atrocious, you know, things, yes, he did. But even with all of that, it, 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 I mean, David suffered, he went through hell. He paid the price for his sins. He paid the price. But it did lose his salvation. And we, we were under the old, it was under the old testament. But God said, look, David, it's a man after my own heart. So, Sister Carita, this is what happens. When we receive Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and Master, it is by grace. It is a gift that is given to us by grace. But if we, do not, you know, because that, that, that grace comes with responsibility, all right? If we do not follow that responsibility and we go on sinning, we are going to pay the price. Mm -hmm. God will continue to forgive us because sometimes people say, well, I will just pray, but yes, God will forgive you, but you will pay the consequences. You will pay the price for it. And then you have the Christians who are abiding by the law. They are not going to pay that, 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 that the, 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 the consequence because they are not committing that sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is going to be a marked difference. You pay the price here. You may go to heaven, but you pay the price here. But then, when we all go to heaven, we are not going to be under the same category. Do you understand that? Because there are those who are going to get the crown. There are those who are going to get the crown with the, with, with the two and in eight. All right? But we are all in heaven. We are in different places. Just like I always use the example of graduation. Kids graduate with with A, 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 A plus. You will graduate with minus C, but you still graduated. <laughs> All right? But you're rewarding greater than those who are not putting in the effort. And so that's why, as you are saying, when we are saved, we continue. It, 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 it's a work in progress. Because we are all seen as it's work in progress. That's why the Lord's Prayer, we say, you know, our Father who has never allowed with thy name, you know, we pray to God, we ask Him, we follow His name for Him to guide us so that we do not sin. Because sin is always right under our noses. We can smell it, we can see it, we can touch it. But it's the grace of God. And how we, when we spend time in the Word of God, we spend time praying, you know, that's what is going to help us. And that's our responsibility hmm. as Christians. So I don't know whether that answers the question, but you know, yes, you will be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They will pay the price. Yes, and then we put our 
This word is perishable, crown. but the crown that Apostle Paul is talking about is unperishable crown. So, so, so it, it, it's not it, it's, a, it's a spiritual symbol that that defines your relationship with God, your status in heaven, how 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 close you are to, to the seat of 
to the to the throne of grace. So so so, so that's what he's talking about. It's not talking about the scepter that the that, that the, the Roman um, emperor wear or anything of the sort. Uh, I thought it is like like it is it is shaped like a crown <laughs> or no, that's just the picture. That's just the, that, that's the picture the illustration of it. <laughs> and yeah, I won't be there. Yeah, but I'm
Good night. Don't Good night.